Hi, my name is Lee Mulcahy, and I am doing community interviews. Uh, and this is uh, Sean Cox. Hi, I would just like to start off by giving a little introduction about myself. I'm from Montana. I was raised in a Christian family, and um, as I grew up, I developed a lot of misconcepts about life and um, moved to Los Angeles and um, kind of lived a wild child life. And then um, later, I got back into going to church, and the Lord delivered me from a lot of uh, things that I had suffered with throughout my years. And one of them was um, fear of people, fear of man. And um, I had a hard time talking in public and a lot of other issues that he delivered me from. And so um, I'm very thankful to God for the freedom I have and knowing a new level of love that I could have never known um, just walking in my own um, ideas and thoughts. And we also have James here who is um, in charge of the homeless encampment out there at the Intercept lot. We would like to hear a few things from you. Good morning. How are we doing this morning? Fant Good. Fantastic. Good. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, yeah, I am. Uh, I was kind of handpicked uh, by uh, Nan Sandin. She is our uh, director of the Department of uh, Health and Human Services, uh, Aspen Cares. And um, at first I was in shock, but then I took it as a compliment later, you know, that they wanted me to be the stand-in guy for them. You know, I know most of these guys, and they thought, well, you know, it might go easier if he does it. But, yeah, you know, so far so good. Uh, things are going well out there. We have a lot of gracious donors that have been helping us. We get uh, three food donations a week. Uh, one gal from Snowmass Village that runs the housing department up there, her name is Becky. She comes down on Fridays and fixes up with food and everything. And Did, did she take over for Joe Coffey? Yeah, she took over after my friend Joe Coffey died, okay? Um, that was really a s sad part of bad times around here, right? And then happened where his son died also. It was really, what a heartbreaker. I was really good friends with Joe. I helped him build his personal home years ago on top of Brush Creek Village. And How it, long have you been living here? Uh, I've been here quite a few years. Uh, I want to say since 82, you know, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting up there in years, you know, mucking the, mucking the valley, <laughs> you know, but I love it here, you know. We got good people, you know, we got the best fire department, we got the best sheriff's department, got the best police department. We have a top-notch hospital. And, you know, there's a bunch of great people here. You know? What brought you here? I came to help my brother out. He was going through a real bad divorce, and every once in a while we'd get a phone call from him over in Denver, and it would be 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, okay, and he, with every phone call that was happening, he, he was sounding more suicidal than ever. So I, I came, basically came out here to babysit him a little bit, you know. And it was easy for me to be a role model for him because I would came out of a bad divorce out of the uh, Chicago area, and I happened to have custody of my son at the time, which was only three years old. So it was appropriate what happened where I had a chance to, you know, sit in and look after my brother and so on and so forth. But, but a, a point was hit where... I, I had to get a job, okay, because I was rapidly running out of money, you know, babysitting my older brother. But, you know, that's the way it happened, and, you know, I've been here ever since. So you fell in love with the community? I fell in love with it immediately. You know, I thought, well, you know, it's kind of a spendy area, but the air was clean. I was meeting great people on a daily and monthly basis, and I thought to myself, what a great place. So, you do know, you remember when parking was free? I remember when parking was free. I remember when they had uh, two by six uh, wood sidewalks in front of uh, Little Annie's and O'Leary's and, 
you know, down towards the bank corner. You know, it was great. I heard a story at church that the first stoplight was shot out by um, one of the ancestors of the uh, Texas Revolution. Have you heard that story? You know, I've never heard that one before. You know, I, I imagine that the Aspen has a lot of hidden folklore, you know, of stuff that's happened, you know, you know, from the mining days. And I guess uh, Durant Street was uh, some kind of like a brothel zone, you know. Oh, yeah. And uh, all the old stories and, you know, people just camping wherever they could camp. And, you know, of course, that's all gone away, you know. I mean, through the years, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's been revamped. Uh, they make up more laws. More rules. More rules, more laws, more stringent requirements. You know, and it's, uh, it's, it's one of the factors, I think, that, uh, that uh, helps a person gain homelessness. Amen. You know, I mean, there's probably uh, somebody right now somewhere that's about to say, that's it, I give up. You know, they're behind on the rent. You know, the, the uh, company's coming to repossess their car because they can't make the payments. You know, and somebody's turning homeless right now as we speak. You know, it's a shame, too, because homelessness is becoming a worldwide epidemic. It's not just in the States. It's happening all over the world. Okay, because it's, it's lack of money. People are not getting paid up the right way for if they're working a skilled job, being diligent, being loyal. Well, <clears throat> the concept of a living wage has never gained a foothold with our politicians here, our liberal no. politicians. Right. You know. Well, you know, it's only going to get worse, okay, because uh, the government keeps printing up money, you know, and it's backed by virtually nothing. Okay, and uh, you know, as soon as that money gets into circulation, okay, the the most powerful addiction on the world is in the world is greed. You know, so everybody goes, okay, well, we're raising our prices, okay, we're trying to collect all this loose money that's bouncing around, and that's exactly basically what that, that's basically exactly. what exactly it's basically what and, and that is the struggle that we have dealt in this with this community. It's been community versus resort or big money, however you want to say that. And, you know, the crazy thing is, you know, I love how you say that this has become, I mean, it's not a great thing, but, but you make a great point. You say this is a billionaire's hangout. Well, I knew that from the get-go, and I thought, you know something, I'm not going to get involved with their politics. <laughs> you know, this is their playground, okay? And I thought if I could, you know, fit in and be a humble servant somewhere, I was happy with that. Amen. You know? I mean, I wasn't looking to, to live an extravagant lifestyle here. You know, I mean, back in the day, you could, you could rent a trailer and smuggler. You'd get a roommate situation with someone that was renting a mm -hmm. four-bedroom house, right, where, okay, here, I'll give you a deal. You get to rent the room. Here, you and your son can live in this room. We'll only charge you $700 a month. And that was even high back in the day. Right. Okay, but you didn't have to pay electric. You could use the landline. This is before... Everybody had their little UFO walkie-talkies, you know. Right, right, right. You know, so you know, you know, it is it, it is what it was, if I can say it that way, that you know you could actually afford, you know, you could afford to do the compulsory insurance law, which came into play, you know, shortly after I uh, arrived here, and you could, you know, maintain your vehicle. You know, put a little money on the side. You could afford to buy a pair of tires, this and that. Well, now over the years, right? Well, well you know, hell, if you're only pulling down sixty grand a year, okay, believe me, you're living paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how's how's everybody um, how's everybody doing out there? Well, you know, we got some good newspaper exposure, right? And uh, they published uh, uh, one of our guys' phone numbers in the uh, paper several times. So we've been getting Vince. calls, so, so there is sporadic work going around. Right, right. And that number, just so in, if anybody in the audience needs work, is 970-456-3638, right? That, that's, that's correct. Yeah. That's a correct copy on that number. So there has been, you know, people calling. You know, and of course, they want to take advantage of this uh, COVID thing, you know, with, oh, I'll pay you $15 an hour and... 
-hmm. so on and so forth. But see, you know, it's better than a, it, it's been better than a, a poke in the eye with a sharp stick, actually. You know, so it's, it's benefiting a few people that want to go out there and work. Mm -hmm. and, and you do uh, have qualifications, too, to lead all kinds of different work, right? Um, I'm very uh, skilled in the construction industry. Okay, I've been doing that most of my life here. When I first came here, okay, I was working in the restaurants because I was a, a trained chef from the Chicago and Milwaukee area when I came out here. And I chose not to work in the restaurants anywhere because the, the owners really didn't want to pay you all that much. They were always worried about their profit margin and how much money that they, they were making as well as if they had partners. So they were more focused on themselves yeah, and there's been a lot of newspaper stories about how they got busted by the Department of Labor for not paying people overtime. And well, the thing of it is, is it's, you know, I, I think it was always going to be like that, and that's why I decided that I was going to go right to work and, and be a laborer and uh, start paying attention to what's going on. You know, it's not like I didn't know how to handle a hammer and a nail before I came here or run a handsaw. You know, I had you know, some kind of concept about building. But I, I did most of my uh, training and learning right here in the Roaring Fork Valley. And you've had supervisory positions, right, with different people? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've been in charge a few times. Okay, like I said earlier, right, I helped my friend Joe Coffey build his house on top of uh, Bruss Creek Village. And then uh, just recently I was with a company called FCI and uh, I was on the remodel up in Snowmass for the employee housing on uh, seven buildings. It was uh, Palisades and uh, the, old, uh, the old Abitadorfs, which they call uh, Brush Creek Apartments now. And I, I worked on that project with FCI doing the facelift and uh, total remodel. And uh, as a matter of fact, the superintendent had made uh, a friend of mine and I had carpenters on that job. So we were overseeing probably 20 other people that were involved with the project. So you've held these great positions and yet you still are homeless. I've been turned down three times for housing, okay? And when I first tried to get the ball rolling was uh, when I turned 62. So that was three years ago. And uh, they excluded me from Pitkin and Eagle almost immediately. And then they told me I was eligible for Garfield County. Well, the first time that I was picked and they wanted me to do the rental application, it was the same thing as the third turn down. You make too much money, mm. right? Second time, it was the same story. You make too much money, right? On this last time, what I did was I asked my employer to cut my hours to 24 opposed to 40, and I reapped with them, sent them all the paperwork, told them the truth and nothing but the truth, and I still got turned down because they said, you make too much money. Wow. For, for the housing. So I just thought to myself, well, I guess I'm just going to have to wait it out. I'm going to have to continue to live as I'm living you know, homeless, and uh, I'm kind of not working right now because I had a shoulder injury. So the only uh, employment I have right now is uh, helping the county out is uh, hosting and managing this camp up at uh, Brush Creek Intercept lot. And so far, so good. I, I, I think we're doing well out there. We've had a few problems. It's nothing that, you know, can be solved. It can be solved and straightened out. It's, you know, a lot of people have, an under, uh, have a hard time, you know, having the appetite to uh, obey by rules and stuff like that that's laid down by other higher-ups. So let's talk about the law enforcement. What's going on with that? What do you, how do you mean? No, I th look, I think I, was, I, I saw the sheriff uh, the other day, Bob, and, you know, he said we live in a police state. Well, you know, it has been, you know, it wasn't like that when I moved here, no. but, but it has become a police state. And uh, I'll have to say, uh, Bob Broaddus is one of our better uh, sheriffs in this county. Amen. Uh, and, Amen. And, and he's the best, and 
I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that all the rest of the sheriffs that we have here continued in the future, okay, would, uh, would take the stance of uh, Bob Broaddus, you know, his demeanor, you know, his, uh, you know, policies. And, Community policing. And, uh, you know, yeah, and his attitude, okay, because he was probably the best one we ever had here. You know, what a, what a great guy. And you, you knew Sheriff Keenest. I knew Keenest for a while. Okay, I was uh, uh, running to him at running into him at um, AA meetings and uh, Narcotic Anonymous meetings. There's a couple times where you know I had a I had to go clean up. Okay, because of the you know you turn into a party hound. <laughs> you know this and that. Okay, and it's happened to me a couple times. I'm not ashamed to say that I had to scrub my act up a couple times. But your story is one of redemption. Don't you know? Well, you know, I had to do something, otherwise I wasn't going to live very long, okay? I'm surprised, you know, that I'm making it to 65. So yeah. I, I pinch myself someday going, <laughs> hey, buddy, you're still alive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so that's the way it is, really. So what made you make the decision to clean up your act, as you said? Well, you know, I wanted to have stuff, you know. I wanted to have another, I wanted to uh, operate a car again. You know, I, I had hopes and dreams of uh, getting another rental, you know. And uh, it's taken me 10 years here being on the homeless scene, being homeless, to finally get things straightened away in my life, you know. So I got a car. I can depend on the car. You know, I live in the car. The car takes me where I want to go. It's helping me out with uh, facilitating the, the camp right now. Um, getting ice, getting water. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, so, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful, right, that, you know, I, I finally learned how to do things the right way. You know, buy insurance, conform with the law, you know, be respectful and kind to other people. You know, and there's a lot of great people in this valley. A lot of great, hard-working folks. I love what you say about the government, that it's, uh, it's a mafia. Well, you know, I don't really call it the Republican Party and the Democratic Party anymore. I refer to them as the, the Gambinos and the Terezis. Yep. Okay. And then you got the people that really have a true heart, right, that really would like to see the government return to the people. I think Nan Sandin uh, is very helpful with that. She brings in the faith communities because I think as a society, we, we, we will be judged by how we treat the disenfranchised, whether it's, you know, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's, uh, whether it's, it's the poor. But our, it seems here in Aspen that our politicians need to be more respectful of poor people and to take that example that Nan uh, illustrates, servant leadership, right? And, and um, what, she's, what she's doing and what, what you're doing, uh, I, I think is, is, is heartwarming. Well, thanks for saying so. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going through a learning process on this, right? I've never really had a, um, an opportunity to to manage people, you know, that have, um, you know, personal problems, right? You know, and mm. I know, you know, all these guys, I know they've been, all these people here out there, they've been raised with good family values and everything, but they're just, you know, life has made them that way, you know, and and it, it, it flips their brain out too because they're going, I never thought I'd be homeless. Right. You know, and then they can't, you know, forgive themselves you know, so every day they get a little harder on themselves, you know, so they're drinking like a banshee, you know. Yeah. Every time they get some money in their hands, you know, they're running to the dispensaries, you know. And, you know, I imagine if I had the same attitude and, uh, and was hard on myself, I'd probably be doing the same thing, you know. But I keep telling myself, hey, hey, James, you got better things to do. You know, um, you've really cleaned up your act. You know, we've we've all we've all made mistakes in life, but you, I mean, you are a, a inspiration to I'm sure people in your camp. 
Well, you know, jealousy and envy, you know, same thing like greed, you know, never goes away, you know. Um, How do we get to be a more just society here? I think the county is taking a step in the right direction, okay, to figure out the homeless deal. I think a good step for probably every employer, you know, in this upper part of the valley should start thinking is if they pay their employees, you know, what they're worth, you know, as far as what their skill level is, mm -hmm. it would make them a more happy and content employee, Amen. you know, with more longevity. Amen. You know, one thing that bothers me is years ago, right, you could have a, a, a job here with longevity and everything that went with that, okay, and then if you're working for a good person or a good company, you would get, uh, you know, a raise every six months, you know, to where they're going, hey, you're then, then you'd have to hear the words, hey, you're doing a good job. Yeah, and I think it, it has to be uh, pointed out that the largest company sets the standard, right? Well, usually the, the, the biggest company are probably the biggest control freaks, if I can put it that way. Yeah, well, okay. so, so Skiko has 4,500 employees in Aspen. And if the billionaires that own it are not going to pay a living wage, then I don't understand why our politicians on city council, just, you know, like Los Angeles, like many cities, enact a minimum wage. They put a minimum wage of, uh, you know, $18 an hour, then that's going to encourage everyone else to pay better. Yeah, but you have to understand the aspect of that, Lee. Um, you get a job like that with an entity like uh, the Aspen Ski Company. Yes, sir. And then they'll, they'll say, okay, you're eligible. We're going to pay you X amount of dollars here. We're even going to supply you with employee housing. When the job comes to an end, okay, what are you doing? You're 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 homeless because right. you gotta vacate the the housing. So, you know, it's kind of a tease and a chum, wouldn't you think? Absolutely. Okay, and um, that tends to kind of mess people up up here, you know. Okay, especially if they're out there. Hey, I'm gonna go out and meet a girlfriend tonight. Let's go out and have some drinks and. What have you, everything that goes along with that, okay? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, 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 it's a factor of, uh, you know, people having uh, mental health issues around here. Well, and I think that's where the faith community can come in because, uh, you know, when you go into a church and you get, and you can speak to this, um, 20 hugs, that's a lot of love, you know, and... Um, as I think as churches, I think we need to strive to be more helpful to our our brothers and sisters down in the encampment. I, love, I thought that was a beautiful letter. Uh, Phil Sullivan's wife, Mona Lisa, you guys thanked her for bringing you guys Yeah, yes, hot yeah, food. yes, we did. I talked with her. I talked with the daughter over the phone, and I said, thank you so much. And she said, don't forget to include my mother's name in there. And I said, thank you. You guys are really sweethearts of the human beings. And they said, you need anything? Give us a call, honey. Right? And they were so sweet. Incredible and family, you know, of this community. Now, I think it need, it, we have to point out that, uh, or I will, that uh, the city attorney tried to put him behind bars for 15 years. Is that right? I didn't know about that. Yeah, yeah, because he wouldn't buy a city business license. He's in Woody Creek, and, and you know, he's a libertarian, and... Um, yeah, they put him in jail. They put Mona Lisa's husband in jail, Phil Sullivan. You know, he had the free rides for people that need him. Right. And that, to me, is not community. You know, like, you have to put uh, a man that's trying to earn a living in jail for 15 years? What, what's wrong with the, the city hall? Well, you know, everybody gets their own ideas, right? They, they probably copycat a lot of the ideas from our big government, okay? Yep. You know, and I, I don't think that's going to be escapable, you know, in the near future. I think it's probably only going to get worse. You know, and that's just my opinion mm -hmm. on it, you know. But, you know, I always hope that things go better for people, okay, because we are all brothers and sisters. Amen. And, and we're all part of this, you know, and uh, we all have to eat, so we all have to continue working and striving and, 
and having uh, good, solid uh, hopes for the future. So back to Lee's comment about faith. I believe that the Christian community and all the religious communities, the first thing that God calls us to is love. And I think, like you're saying, greed is in the way and all these things. But if we were really godly people and all of us fall short, but the first thing to do is strive for love. And Amen. Amen. So that's, you know, love yourself, love your neighbor, love God. And if that's really what you're focusing on, it's going to solve a lot of problems. You're going to have more community and you're going to see people reaching out to help each other instead of what can I do to get myself ahead? What can I do for me? And I think that that is a lot of the problems with our government and, you know, also with the living situation here. Well, yeah, it has a lot to do with it, okay? Uh, I'm a firm believer in uh, you have to... You have to love and respect yourself, okay, before you can love and respect other people. Right, and uh, um, you know, lest you know God, I think that you can't really know love. There's all these other concepts of what it is, but until you receive his love, you're not going to know real love. I would say that the churches and the synagogues, to your, to your point, are the glue uh, or mosque are the glue of our society because it doesn't matter if you're in the Democratic tribe or the Gambeses or the Republican tribe. You know, we have gotten so tribal in our nation. You know, we, we have like two tribes and the divide between the two, we're Republican, um, most people here are Democrat, over the proper role of government, that divide may lead to the decline of the nation because, you know, it, 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 here, it's tearing our community apart, you know. And it doesn't matter if, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I go back to it's community policing. It's about love, right? And if you've got, you, I remember you telling me that your, your sister's son got a DUI because uh, he was having a beer in the car and the, the engine wasn't even hot. Exactly. Yep. You know, that's not community policing. My neighbor was tased in his own yard. That's not community policing either. And, you know, of course, you know, like two of the poli police officers, like, you know, uh, sheriff, sorry, uh, complained for uh, police brutality. It was investigated, and of course, you know, nothing happens. But that's not atypical, you know what I mean? Um, James, what, what else would you like to say to the community? because you love and are devoted to this community. Well, I, I'm, I like it here, okay? We got a lot of good people, and like I said uh, before, okay, we've got a lot of great uh, community uh, you know, people working in the community, all the departments and so on and so forth, and you know? How can my, you? My, hope, my hopes that things will get better here, you know, for the working man. Amen. You know, instead of the working man being whipped around, you know, and it is a seasonal town. I understand that. Right, right. You know, so it's, it's you know, and, and they do real good here with tourism. You know, I'm, I'm glad that uh, a lot of these uh, business owners can make a bunch of money and, you know, have their own little stake in the, in the pot, you know. And, Should we uh, raise the minimum wage here? It should be raised. Yeah. Okay. That way, you know, people, you know, they're not going to be lining up for, you know, oh, I need some food stamps, uh, oh, I need this, you know, I need that, you know, to make them uh, be able to be a little more self-sufficient. Hey, James, Hoagie, thank you. Love you, brother. Thanks for coming You're in. You're welcome. Thanks Love for... you, too. God bless us all. Amen.